So good morning. Uh, can you all hear me? I'm often hard to hear. My name is Jim Green, and I'm the librarian of the library company in Philadelphia. And um, I want to say, I, in the weeds is where I live. Um, it's where I'm comfortable. And I'm also here partly because I am the, uh, 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 I teach at Rare Book School. I'm one of the faculty members there, and I'm also on the board of directors. And um, so I have to say a little, I give a little pitch for Rare Book School. But, but um, Ray Lynn and Ryan did a great job of telling, I'm sure you'll believe them more than you'll believe me, but it's, it's a wonderful place. And, um, and uh, I encourage you all to look at the website. I have with me a, a list of all the courses. If anybody's interested in seeing on paper um, a list of courses, I have that. We also have them you, outside. You have them outside? On, on paper. On paper. Yes. Cool. <laughs> all right. Um, so, um, yeah, check it out and, and take some courses. Rare Book School is a place where materiality and uh, meets bibliography, meets book history and, um, and media studies in a way that I don't think there's anywhere else that you can, you can bring those things together. And it's my belief and I think the philosophy of Rare Book School that materiality is essential to the understanding of book history, media studies, just as book history makes us better bibliographer, better bibliographers. So, um, so join us, please. Now, anyway, my real job here is to is to uh, moderate this session on crosswalks in American literary history, designing relational databases, and I will introduce all three of our speakers, um, one of whom is is here virtually, and then I'll retire and let them take it away. So, our first speaker is Jordan Gawthon, who's special collections librarian of the Providence Public Library. He's previously held special collections positions at the University of Montana in Missoula and the Rhode Island Historical Society. In addition to an MLS from Indiana University, he holds MA in, uh, an MA in Medieval English Literature from Ohio State, and his topic is Mapping the Book Trade on a Budget. Elizabeth Loring is our virtual participant. Elizabeth, are you there? She is. <laughs> so you're her, you're her re virtual representative. Good, okay, thank you. Elizabeth Loring is Digital Humanities Projects Librarian in the Center for Digital Research in the, Humani Digital Research in the Humanities at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where she works with faculty and students to develop their digital research and scholarship. She's a senior associate editor of the Walt Whitman Archive and co-director of Civil War Washington. Her current research project investigates the application of image processing techniques from computer science to digitize newspaper pages in order to identify poetic content in historic newspapers based on visual patterns on the newspaper page. Today she joins us remotely to talk about relational databases and large-scale thematic research collections. And uh, Molly Hardy is digital human our third speaker, Molly Hardy, is digital humanities um, curator and American Council of Learned Societies public fellow at the American Antiquarian Society where she's working on a database of early American printing trades, which she'll be speaking about today. Her research examines d debates around literary property and race in the 18th century Anglophone transatlantic world. And she's currently completing a digital edition of Absalom Jones and Richard Allen's A Narrative of the Proceedings of the Black People During the Late Awful Calamity in Philadelphia. And on that note, I will I will leave it to you. George, you want to start? Good morning. Uh, am I audible as well, hopefully? Uh, I called this, this talk Mapping the Book Trade on a Budget for two reasons, really. One is not just that it's, not just that it's built with resources that are free and open source and available, but also because I'm really not an expert in either GIS or relational databases. Um, database design, and since our talk is actually subtitled uh, relation, Designing Relational Databases, I figured I should give you that caveat right up front. Um, so I'm approaching this really as kind of an interested amateur, uh, and the project was really sort of a guerrilla um, digital project. So hopefully that'll, that, uh, that background will be useful. I came to this because, well, I came to it honestly, like I say, as sort of an interested amateur who expected that this research resource would already exist. Uh, I was looking for information about the Rhode Island book trade, and one of the reasons I kind of assumed that I could go and find it mapped 
is that we've got a pretty good tradition of mapping the book trades. So this is an image from uh, one of James Raven's books in which he was mapping out the London book trade. And if you, you probably can't see, but if you, if you could, um, you'd notice that this is mapped in really incredible detail, down to the inch. Uh, so there are places out there where you can, uh, you can get really detailed information about the book trade. And there are great online resources, like the Atlas of Early Printing from the University of Iowa, uh, which maps the spread of printing and the book trades in the 15th century uh, throughout Europe. But uh, when I tried to find something similar for American uh, book trade, I really didn't see anything like that. So I figured I would try to develop that. Uh, and the result was this, uh, the Atlas of the Rhode Island Book Trade in the 18th century, um, which was completed, I guess, insofar as it's complete, a couple years ago. And I'll just walk through it real quickly. Essentially, it's, uh, it's a resource to try to map out all the book trade members in the state uh, up to 1800. It combines timeline and maps, so as you kind of scroll through time, different uh, markers pop up. Each marker provides some basic information about the person or organization in question. So this is a, a paper mill. And then uh, clicking the link takes you to the sort of database proper and um, full details for, for whatever that was. From the database side, you can also, of course, search and browse. So if we want, let's say, bookbinders active for, before 1760, we can get a list and then jump right back to to the map and see where they were at work. And then finally, uh, I added historic overlays for Providence and Newport, the two major towns, um, with maps rectified in QGIS, an open source uh, GIS application. Um, and there are, I should say, there are many details of the interface, um, and this maybe will come up in a bit, but that if it were possible to customize, I think, more fully, uh, would have been improved. So that was one of the, uh, one of the issues. Let me go back to this. Um, the basic, as I say, this is kind of a, sort of a guerrilla project of just trying to get something uh, together with relatively limited resources. I chose technology that was, that would allow essentially those two things, putting together a map, putting together a timeline, and some basic customization. Um, so for the map side, really the site is kind of in two pieces. The map side is, uh, is based on JavaScript framework called timemap.js, which uh, basically glues together these two existing components, uh, the Google Maps API and the uh, simile timeline widget from MIT. And it accepts data in um, a number of formats like XML and JSON. That XML file that drives the points on the, the database is um, generated by a custom MySQL database that I put together. Uh, a fairly simple database, I guess. I don't know if any of that is actually visible. Uh, but this is the basic uh, structure. Everything kind of focuses on that center table of events. So each point on the map or each record in the database is essentially a, an event, uh, which is defined as an agent, the book, uh, bookseller, the printer, uh, organization, a beginning date, an end date, latitude, longitude, and notes for the, the actual database entry. One other field uh, that I th should probably mention from the sort of database perspective um, is down at the bottom, the sort of precision rating. This is one of those, this is one of the issues that cropped up really quickly uh, working on the project. Oftentimes, on the one hand, there might be uh, a printer whose house still exists and we have really detailed 
uh, and precise information about where he was at work. Uh, on the other hand, there were people who we only knew the town or probably kind of worse, uh, you know, they described their location as west of the bridge or near the hay scales, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and I didn't want somebody using this to assume that a pin in the map implied precise information when it didn't. Uh, and I think this is really kind of kind of one of those difficulties that online resources face that print resources don't necessarily because we just don't know at what level this kind of information is going to be used. Uh, and so it's hard to make clear that um, it is either, it's hard to dictate how somebody's going to use it basically. So this was an attempt, a really rough, uh, not uh, completely elegant and very subjective attempt to give at least some indication if you were looking at an entry um, whether it was referring to a specific you know, house or a block or just a general kind of organization, a uh, general area. So, uh, so far, I guess I've been talking about, since we are talking about databases, uh, talking about the technological side of the site, um, but the real the real time-consuming part of developing the resource was getting that data uh, into the database itself. So I used a, a bibliography a directory published in 1958 by Modern Glenn Brown, uh, directory of the Rhode Island book trade. And at the top is a pretty typical entry. So this is Paul Mumford, a merchant bookseller who was at work at the sign of the Blue Bell in Thames Street uh, in 1769, 1770. Thames Street, I should say, is not the incorrect pronunciation. Um, that's the way they do it. I don't know why. Uh, so at some point early on, I just kind of assumed that I naively assumed that I would be uh, essentially just translating this into data. Um, and I spent some number of hours trying to find the blue bell in Thames Street finally decided to, to go back to the newspaper article and uh, down at the bottom that's what I found. So Paul Mumford at the sign of the blue ball in Thames Street uh, opposite Mr. Aaron Lopez. Is the blue ball, very different, searching for that, actually found a location. Um, and that crucial data about Mr. Aaron Lopez is really the easiest, you know, that's a, a well-known wharf, a well-known location. Um, and so taken together, uh, we can put him on the map, Paul Mumford on the map, with uh, a, a relatively good degree of, of precision. Um, so each, essentially each pin in the map was its own unique challenge of that sort, uh, which I didn't really expect going into it, but um, oftentimes entertaining. I haven't actually spent a lot of time actually using um, using the atlas to sort of do analysis and interpret the book trade. But even at a b very basic level, uh, it's been helpful just to get a sense of kind of the statewide uh, contours of the book trade. So for instance, uh, recognizing how densely concentrated uh, the book trade was in Providence and Newport, how much was outside of those two towns. Within the individual towns, uh, how concentrated, concentrated was it in a sort of central market area um, for each of those. And then oftentimes uh, this geographic data, just, just being able to sort of see these people side by side uh, was useful. So this is, this is one example of, we've already met Paul Mumford um, and his placement on the map. Another bookseller, Mary Malam, whose uh, advertisement is on the right there. Point out as a side note, she's entered as a bookseller. Um, this is a list of all the products she had for sale. And at the very, very bottom, the very last line, uh, she also has a set of Pamela and Clarissa in four volumes. So that's, that's a bookseller. Um, it's not necessarily somebody with, uh, with just books. But Mary Malin, Paul Mumford, two of many uh, people who were plotted on the map, once they were actually there uh, and sort of visualized, I kind of started looking into, uh, I think, Mary a little bit more. Discovered that they're both working here in the 1760s. In 1769, I believe it was, they married. Um, and so here I was kind of trying to map out the book trade 
Well, unbeknownst to me, I was perhaps mapping out their personal romantic uh, history as well. I can imagine them staring across the street at each other <laughs> from one shop to the other. Um, so one of the issues that, that I think we're going to talk about of that issue last Wednesday when I, I went to the Atlas to try to get a sense of, uh, I was checking on something, um, and discovered it was broken, completely broken, and broken in the worst possible way. Uh, it looked like everything was fine, everything you know, seemed okay. Clicking on any of the pins, though, did absolutely nothing. Uh, so it just looked like a map with a bunch of uh, non-data. Right? No one could see who any of those people were. I spent some number of hours uh, trying to cobble together a solution. I think it was Google Maps switching over from one version to another of their API. Eventually, you know, got it working again. But it was a poignant reminder of how these kind of resources are Maybe not so much the data, but the resource itself is incredibly fragile and needs to be shepherded and uh, sort of watched at every step along the way. So again, the budget solution for me when it comes to uh, sort of long-term curation of the data is really hoping that the data itself gets kind of vacuumed up and incorporated into, into some kind of larger resource, some kind of larger uh, atlas of the book trade generally in America. And there are, I think, some good signs that that's a, a possibility. So this is a slide provided um, by Kristen Doyle Highland, a researcher at New York University, who is doing um, some similar kind of work in New York with the antebellum trade, uh, mapping out the book trade there and coming up with really interesting analysis and conclusions uh, based on the geography of the trade in the city. Another example, uh, Paul Destelberg, uh, a researcher in, uh, in the Netherlands, has essentially solicited information of any sort of this type from anyone who's willing to offer it. And he's compiling it um, for, at this point, a number of European cities uh, already included. Uh, so there seems to be, the data itself seems to be being gathered. People seem to be interested in um, collecting it and presenting it. Uh, and I'm hopeful that that will be the solution for for long-term data curation. Um, I wanted to finish up with a quick story about a couple of characters, my favorite characters, I think, uh, from the Atlas. And I really think this is one of the, one of the sort of side benefits of, of these kind of projects, just that they give a chance to kind of dig in and find interesting people. Um, James Lipscomb and uh, Daniel Todd were two bookbinders in the 1720s. They don't show up in the, the published directory of the Rhode Island Book Trade. They don't show up in any other uh, reference source that I sort of checked. They do, however, show up in the judicial records of the colony of Rhode Island, uh, both of them, where in the 1720s, uh, James Lipscomb, first of all, absconded to New York uh, because of debt, uh, leaving behind his binding tools. The records include a letter from one of his creditors say, basically suggesting uh, you should come back, you can be forgiven, uh, you'll get your tools back. And it includes a, a postscript at the very bottom in which this creditor writes to Lipscomb, uh, P.S. Your man Todd is in prison on suspicion of theft in company with a brazier. So this is, uh, this is the Todd in question. This is his indictment. Uh, Daniel Todd, another, another binder is accused of breaking in in 1728 August in the dark time of the night with force of arms and in company with Peter Morrow and stealing six silver spoons, uh, a silver scissors chain, five silk stockings, one pair of worsted and one pair of thread stockings. Uh, I, love, I love the image of Newport in the 1720s with bookbinders running around in the night stealing people's socks. Uh, <laughs> so you'll see Peter Morrow, his uh, accomplice. This is, he, he was questioned as part of the proceedings. And uh, this is his, this is the uh, transcript of his um, interrogation. So he was asked, if you can, if you can kind of see, uh, was Todd, Daniel Todd, that lodged with you uh, in drink or not? The answer from, from Peter Morrow is, he was disguised in liquor very much when we went to my shop. Um, so I hope, I hope if nothing else, uh, 
Uh, if you take nothing else from this, if you find yourself this evening after the symposium out um, enjoying yourself, perhaps with a few too many drinks, mm -hmm. uh, you will be at the very least able to turn to your companions and uh, describe your state in authentic 18th century <laughs> manner as, uh, as too much disgu disguised in drink. Um, so that's a quick overview of the atlas, and I'll look forward to, to any questions. Okay, can you hear me? <laughs> okay. There's a little bit of a delay, and I'm going to turn off the audio from there so there's no feedback. So, here goes. <clears throat> okay. Um, I want to first thank Ryan Cordell as well as Molly for allowing me to participate remotely. And um, I hope Ryan you'll gesture if anything is wrong, <laughs> since I can't hear. Okay. <laughs> My presentation today is going to look at the relational database of one large-scale digital research project, um, the Walt Whitman Archive. The presentation will be part demonstration. I'm going to switch views. part demonstration of the databases developed for the Whitman Archive as well as part meditation on the relational database as a methodology for investigating, modeling, and representing humanities content. On one level, the goal of the databases developed for the archive and elsewhere is to make the data and information accessible. But they are also more than that. They're models of what we as the scholars on the projects value about the materials. We experience the materials in new ways by having to go through the process <clears throat> excuse me, of developing data models <clears throat> and looking at the archive databases. My goals are first to underscore how the databases have been constructed for very specific purposes and with very um, specific values. Let me just... <clears throat> Um, and to underscore that the databases and what they more broadly help to structure for large scale thematic research. Oh no. Sorry. Okay. Um, all right. So, although Ed Folsom has famously described the entirety of the Whitman Archive as a database, there, the archive actually <clears throat> includes only two, soon to be three formal databases, as literally defined. In computer science and information management. The oldest of the archive databases and the most straightforward is a public bibliography database, which users of the site encounter as a search interface. The database includes all English language criticism on Whitman from 1838 to the present and a growing amount of foreign language criticism. If I search for materiality, for example, receive 11 results, the first of which is an entry from a, a French language article um, published in 2011, going back to the first piece um, from 1877. This database grew out of the quarterly bibliography that Ed Folsom completes at, for each issue of the Whitman Quarterly Review and the earlier bibliography of Whitman criticism completed by Scott Giant Valley. The work to update this database is ongoing at the University of Iowa. I'm not going to emphasize this database today just because it's relatively straightforward and because we're planning to move away from the relational database and probably to an XML model for it, but I'm happy to field questions about it. In addition, we have an in-progress um, database that sets out to document Whitman's reading. Whitman's reading is an area that has been of interest to the Whitman Archive and Whitman scholarship for many years. Contributors to the Whitman Archive renewed interest in the idea of documenting Whitman's reading over the last several years, beginning in 2010 uh, with Vanessa Steinroder's dissertation research on reading in the Civil War and Matt Cohen's interest in Whitman's annotations and marginalia, and when their interests converged. 
then as part of Cohen's NEH funded project on Whitman's marginalia, we're in the process of developing a database rec to record evidence of Whitman's reading. So there are, um, some of the best examples for documenting Whitman's reading are those um, texts that are by another author on which Whitman actually um, made annotations or drafts towards his own material. Still in an early prototype phase, the database will document the books, articles, and other pieces of information, including evidence of Whitman's encounter with the text. And again, this is a very rough um, prototype interface, but it does give you a sense of the types of information that we're interested in, cap interested in capturing and presenting to readers. So if I do a search for Dickens, I find that um, we have a record of Whitman reading Dickens' Dombey and Son and the um, record for that item. The database will be populated with information drawn from Cohen's marginalia project, as well as from an early dissertation on the subject of Whitman's reading. In addition, updates to the database will become part of the general workflow of the Whitman archive as we process images of new items from our repositories. And although the Whitman archive remains a largely closed system, with regard to user engagement, the reading database has the potential to be the first part of the Whitman Archive to enable user-generated content. Finally, we have a project object management database for organizing the Whitman universe of materials that we're interested in as a project, the Whitman Archive tracking database. <clears throat> and it's this database that I want to spend the most time on today. Although it's um, crucial to nearly everything we do on the archive, it's a private database and then therefore not a database that very many people, I don't think hardly anyone outside of the project gets to see. Yet understanding the database and how it came about <clears throat> suggests a great deal about the larger values and interests of the archive. The Whitman Archive tracking database is, as I said, for now a private object management database that organizes objects of interest for Whitman Archive contributing researchers and staff. The rationale for the database is to provide a single point of access to the content that the Whitman Archive is interested in. The database can include um, any object that exists in the world that is of interest to us to document because of its relationship to Whitman, whether or not we have any type of digital representation. We have designed the database to be able to represent objects of a variety of types, text, images, audio, ephemera, and regalia, but as most users of the archive know, our primary interest has been text. So the text module of the database is the most robustly developed. While we have not fully developed the other modules to this point, as the need arises, we will be able to extend the database with relative ease in order to document information about these types of objects. For any of the object forms, the database documents information about the original object and adds information relevant <clears throat> within the context of the Whitman Archive. Looking at an individual object record helps to draw out some of the details. And then I'm showing here the record for an item we call HYB.00002. Each item in the database has a Whitman Archive ID like this one, and the unique identifier for the object both within the database and on the public website. Typically, the three-letter code at the beginning of an Archive ID is a code for the repository that holds the original item, so LOC for Library of Congress or UVA for the University of Virginia. But in the case of HYB2, pieces of the letter manuscript are actually held at two different institutions. Here then, in this database record, we're reconstructing the letter from Louisa Van Belser Whitman to her son Walt Whitman from March 16, 1870. We record a title for the item, the type of object, and object notes. We also record information about the creator or creators of the item and the, their role in the authorship of the document for the creation of the object. Here we record that Louisa is the primary creator as the author of the text, but also um, Walt Whitman is a secondary creator since he added a note on the letter's envelope indicating the letter is from Dear Mother. We record information about the mode, manuscript, or print, as well as the genre of the object, and both categories can take multiple values. 
In addition, we record information about the status of the object and the overall Whitman archive workflow. And finally, we record information about each surface of the text object. Surfaces roughly equate to pages, although in some cases, this isn't always true or that doesn't always map in this way. And I can say more about that in a moment. In order to deal with items whose constituent pieces are held at multiple repositories, we record repository and collection information here at the surface level. So you'll see surfaces um, from Beinecke and then further down surfaces from the Library of Congress. As well as information about whether the surface is a recto or verso, its order and the overall material construction of the object, and whether the surface exists in a fixed state, which is really a question of whether there are pastons or other features of the surface that can be manipulated. And uh, because this is a database that we really never show publicly, um, you're seeing, you know, something, if it were for public consumption, we would change. We have a sort of improper form of the word de determinacy here. It should be determinate. So you'll just have to ignore that, which we've done now for several years. The last information for each surface includes the location of any digital images that we have for the surface. So what we're recording here is information about the, the object, but then also information about digital derivatives or digital representations about that object. But we don't um, describe those digital representations themselves in any significant detail except to provide access to them. Just quickly, another example, this one, a prose manuscript held at the Huntington Library. Um, you see its archive ID, information about um, authorship, genre and mode, and the surfaces. We might note here what we do not record. Um, perhaps most notably, we do not record date in any consistent way. I'd be interested to hear from people anything else that jumps out at you as something as an omission. The lack of a date field in the tracking database is not simply because we didn't think about date. Rather, at the point at which items get entered into the tracking database, dates for many of the materials um, are not easily known. We do, not, we do not do the research to date items until much later in the process and we aren't, weren't sure that dates would be usefully recorded in the database as a result. And just Since the number of items that had date information would always be a subset of the whole, we also didn't want to create a false sense of completeness. For example, we can imagine wanting to search for all poetry manuscripts that date to 1855. We don't, haven't been able to actually provide that date information for most things. It's not that useful, and it gives a false sense of the total whole. In addition, dealing with uncertainty and ambu ambiguity with regard to dates requires a great deal of overhead. And you saw an attempt at dealing with um, uncertainty in regard to geographic place in the earlier database, and we often have to do similar types of things when it comes to representing um, representing the dates as well. As, um, what, it, what we've had to do elsewhere is provide um, two different dates to get at a single date so that we can account for date ranges, essentially an earliest possible date and the latest possible date. If the dates are the same, we take it to be a known date, but ranges might span a month, a year, or multiple years. This setup can be a powerful structure for dealing with dates, but it also adds complexity to the data structure, requires more time of the person inputting the information, and requires more processing of the data to provide a useful result in the web interface. For a variety of reasons, then, the database is not the place to record information in a standard indexable way. For our purposes, that work happens elsewhere, typically in an XML representation of the item, whether it's API for items that we transcribe and encode in EAD or encoded archival description for finding aids or in VRA core for visual works including photographs and engravings. Um, but so that's kind of the, the brief tour of the database and now um, some sort of thoughts on why, why it's useful to communicate this to people if it really is a private project database. But within the last year or so, we started some conversations about whether to make the database publicly accessible to users of the Whitman Archive. There are a number of very good reasons for making the database publicly accessible, but naturally there are some complications as well. 
First, the advantages to doing so. If you go to the publicly accessible Whitman Archive site, um, you, act, you have access to only a small portion of what we've actually gathered. What you have access to is a regular user remains a partial view of everything that we might potentially treat. Typically, content does not appear on the Whitman Archive unless that content has received our full editorial treatment, which includes gathering and processing digital images and adding metadata, creating TEI encoded transcriptions, and preparing HTML views of the encoded text for nice web publication. There are, to the contrary, there are nearly 14,500 records in the tracking database, easily more than half of which are not represented in some form in the public Whitman archive. So as project members thinking has changed over the years, my sense is that the only reasons we have for opposing making the database public at this point are resource constraints. For example, we would need to develop a public interface that filters out some information. Some project notes are for internal purposes only. We'd need to evaluate those cases where our rights to use images are for private research purposes only and not for publication. Right now, this information is inconsistent running text. But if we were going to have a public interface, we would need to be able to suppress these images from public view that we did not have the rights to publish. Other practical concerns include simply balancing this work with the work of ongoing projects and needing to optimize the code for many simultaneous users. And we've heard a lot lately about the need to optimize code for many users. Right now, um, in our case, only a handful of users are able to use the database at a given time, and we're already pushing the limits of lag time for things like the search. If we made it publicly accessible, we would need to optimize the code. Nonetheless, I believe we are working toward the day when the Whitman Archive tracking database will be publicly accessible and provide some form of access to the thousands and thousands of objects that are within the interest of the archive. <clears throat> but because of the origins of the database, it will have some shortcomings for public use. Because we have so intensely focused on the database as it relates um, to the needs of the Whitman Archive, we have not referenced authority files, such as the Virtual International Authority File, to provide canonical references to authors. We have not been concerned with data structures that will lend themselves easily, necessarily, to linked data environments. The database is a relational model, and so is much of linked open data, so it's possible, but it's certainly not um, how we developed the data structures from the outset. We might compare this to what we've done elsewhere on the site, in our XML files, particularly those for representing visual works, where we have referenced Getty Authority files and we have internal document logic that supports RDF triples, a building block of linked data. On the most basic level, the tracking database allows us to record information about the objects then and to keep advancing the work of the Whitman Archive. Beyond the easy access to information that the database provides and the very functional role it serves in the daily work of the Whitman Archive, what is the value of such a database for thinking about Whitman, 19th century American literature, or textuality more broadly? To start addressing these questions in my time left, I want to look quickly at the documentation. Um, let's see. The documentation, specifically the vocabulary definitions that we generated while constructing the database, which reflect our beliefs about what we were modeling and tracking in the database, as well as our change in thinking over time. For example, we say, for the purpose of determining object form, a text may exist in material form and convey intellectual content. A born digital document has intellectual content, but not material content. A lock of Whitman's hair has material content, but not intellectual content. And what these de definitions indicate is not that we do not believe in the materiality of the digital, because we absolutely do, but that that is not what interests us about the digital as regards the Whitman archive or for this project, at least right now. So what I'm most interested in showing you today then is the documentation surrounding surfaces. That's what's up on the screen. What you see here, and what you see here what struck, is what struck through and what follows, and that's um, reflecting our change in thinking about surface um, as we implemented the database. Um, 
we moved from a what you might call a more theoretical and certainly more complex notion of the surface to something a bit more straightforward initially we were wanting to model in the database what we perceived as a kind of physical reality of the document and the many forms in which it could exist if a new composite leaf created by Whitman was actually two scraps of paper pasted together on which he had also pasted a newspaper clipping we might count that as as many as ten surfaces this understanding changed over time as we attempted to implement this conceptual model. Part of what broke down was the utility of using the database to implement this model, but we were also challenged to think again about the conceptual model itself and what was gained and lost in this highly structural and hierarchical model. For us then, the tracking database, and this is part of why I wanted to talk about it today, that as a project, along with organizing our information, what it became was in a sense, an additional method of close reading of these materials. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. All right, Let's see how this one goes. All right, so um, I'm gonna start by explaining how we're conceiving of this project, the database of the early American printing trade um, at the American Antiquarian Society. And um, when we talk about beginnings at the AAS, uh, we're talking about at least two centuries ago. Um, starting with Isaiah Thomas's research uh, for his ambitious The History of Print in America um, of 1810, the AAS has held the largest collection of data on early American printers. Um, starting in 1927, Avis Clark, the AAS's first trained cataloger, compiled the printer's file during her 43-year tenure here. And her work has been picked up by our catalogers who have corrected and augmented this information in their own contributions to the National Authority Files, or NAF. Uh, the records hosted by the Library of Congress, which enable librarians to provide uniform access to materials in library catalogs and to provide clear identification of authors, publishers, printers, subject headings, etc. Most, though not all of this data, can be found on 25 drawers of cards detailing the work of printers, publishers, binders, and others involved in the early Anglophone American print trade up to 1820. And book historians have consulted these files ever since. So the term printer's file is a bit of a misnomer insofar as the cards chronicle many types of lab labor associated with the book trade. And to put an even finer point on it, they chronicle the careers of people who were in the book trade for brief periods, of figures like Samuel Butts, who started his career as a bookseller in Portland, Maine, and then made his way to Boston to become a haberdasher. Or of Cindy An uh, Sidney Andrews, who was only a printer for the first 13 years of his working life, and then moved from Connecticut to Massachusetts to become a farmer. Or of Joseph, Ga Joseph Gale, who started his career as a printer in Sheffield, England, and ended it as a compositor in Philadelphia. So, um, so we're moving from this uh, term of printer's file, which is what the cards are called, to, to the database of the early American printing trade. We are not, however, wild about the acronym that that renders, DAPT. Um, so I'm going to use it today, but if anyone has any, any ideas, <laughs> we're not totally sold on the, on the name of the database yet. Um, this is all sort of a work in progress, as you're going to see. So um, anyhow, so I'd love to hear suggestions for names. So when I'm talking about the printer's file, I'm talking about the cards. And when I'm talking about DAPT, I'm talking about the database, just to make that clear. OK, so the printer's file makes every effort to capture the complete working life of these protagonists of print to borrow a phrase from Lisa Maruka. And the database that we are now constructing aims to do the same. In his 2008 parting words as president of the Bibliographical Society of America, John Bidwell remarked that, quote, bibliographers can be grateful to the AAS for this valuable source of bibliographical information, end quote, and pressed for the creation of a national biographical dictionary of the early American book trade. So instead of compiling a printed book, we have begun creating an online database in an effort to augment the types of queries our data can answer, but also to allow greater access to this research, resource that until now has only been available in our reading room. We can understand what we are doing as enhancing the work that the card catalog could do for us, and that's sort of what I'm chronicling for you all today. So we estimate that the cards that Clark compiled hold information for some eight to 10,000 book trades people. And I'd like to offer a brief tour of how our data will be entered to give a sense of how we are creating a relational database that can both answer complicated research queries and that contains components of linked open data that will render our data usable by other projects. So we're constructing our database using Microsoft Access. Um, and that database, just it's just sort of the lingua franca at AS. They just use it for a lot of things. So um, we're moving forward for, for our, the first phase of our project in Access. 
Um, and you're going to get to see some access today. I'm showing you guts today. So for ease of massive data entry, uh, which we hope will, convince, um, will commence this summer. Okay. So now into the database. Sorry, these were all. Here we go. Okay. So through the inclusion of multiple tables, which you can see over here on the left. Um, we break down the information about people with as much granu granularity as possible. And then we are able to establish multiple relationships among people, places, um, uh, places of birth, and work, firms, and newspapers. So sorry, the switching in between. Um, so in this instance, um, let's take a look at the one, two, three, four, five cards under the name Seth Alden Abbey. Um, so to go. Sorry, um, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so here he is. All right, so um, so we go to the printer's table first. Um, we turn um, and where we ba enter basic biographical information about Abby. Um, in the in the notes field, uh, we include information that's mentioned in the cards that give an overview of the person's career, um, and that we um, and that we might not have discrete information for. So, for example. Um, this, we're giving like an overview of Abby's career for someone like um, uh, Israel Abrams, who's right below Abby. Um, this would be information that we don't have a discrete field for. And let me explain about that. So um, that's because um, the information about marriages or, or, or parenting, that, that kind of stuff is, is sometimes in the cards and sometimes not. Um, so um, that's what that notes field is for. So in, by including the Library of Congress's um, uh, NAF uh, URI, or Uniform Resource Identifier, which is a string of characters used to identify a web resource, and the, and the VIAF, the Virtual Information Authority Files, we're also um, ensuring that our data um, can be shared directly, um, that we are taking modest but important steps to make DApps data linked and open. Um, and then, um, so the Library of Congress's NAF records um, has another role in our table as well. Um, as I mentioned previously, the work that Clark did is certainly the backbone of this project. But Clark retired from the AAS in 1970, but authority work on people in the book trade um, at the AAS did not, of course, stop with her. Um, the other uh, point to keep in mind here is the cards she left us inevitably have errors. But in order to complete this project in the 21st century, we're trying not to correct all of them or to check all of her facts to see if they're right. So the majority of authority work that has been done at the AAS S, both correcting and adding to Clark's work, has been transformed from the card catalog that she used up to 1970 to the Library of Congress um, NAF files. So to capture the last 40 plus years of work on these files, we'll check the card catalog against any NAF record um, that NWA, and that's Massachusetts, Worcester, American Antiquarian Society, that's sort of the, our tag in, um, in the Library of Congress system, anything that we contributed. So where, the, where there's a discrepancy in fact, we'll enter what the NAF record says. So that's the only kind of correction we're going to make right out of the gate. Let me go back to the database. Okay, um, so, okay, uh, the final field in this table is the publisher's URL, and this provides a user with a stable link to a list of works that the name is associated with in the AAS catalog. 
So if we click on this, and I, I can't because this computer can't be online. Um, if we click on this, uh, we get the link for Seth Alden Abbey, and we would get six results in the, um, in the uh, AAS's uh, catalog, right? Um, uh, because of the AAS's work with the North American Imprints Project, or NAEP, um, in which we're cataloging works that we don't necessarily even hold copies of, our catalog is as close as one will come to a union catalog of imprints in this country before 1820. It's sort of like an uh, English short title, title catalog for U.S. printed works, early U.S. printed works, and can therefore be used to give a sense of a given person's book, pamphlet, or newspaper production history. This is a feature in Ian Maxted's The London Book Trade, 1775 to 1800, and Paul Pollard's Dictionary of the Members of the Dublin Book Trade, 1550 to 1800, that is so helpful, getting a sense of the genres and materials a person primarily helped to produce. So if we turn again to the cards, So if we turn again to the cards, we can see that we've only begun the work of capturing all the data in Abby's profile. We record Abby's locations and the locations of his firms and type of work in various uh, tables. So we have states and cities tables um, where we're also including URIs to ensure that geographical data we enter is also able to be linked. Um, and then I want to, and this is in contrast to the kind of work that Jordan is doing. Um, we don't tend to have address level information in the printer's files, um, but we know how important that information can be. So this is an instance. Um, so most of the printer's files do not include information about firms at the address level, but we're building capacity for such data to be added by users of the database when we release it. And I'll say more about such crowdsourcing potentials in, the mo in, in a moment that we're trying to build into the database. As I mentioned earlier, um, we are also keenly interested, as C Clark was, in reconstruction, reconstructing the various trades people had. And through the trade table, um, I'll show you. Um, uh, we record um, each each. Uh, we record which person had which job when. As you might be able to detect when we look at this extensive trade role table, and I'm just going to scroll down here so you can see all of the different occupations that are listed in the printer file. This is one of my favorite things to do is just scroll through here and see some of the fabulous titles um, for 18th century work. <laughs> um, there is no uniform vocabulary for 18th century occupational titles. And this is an example of how creating linked open data for some aspects of our work in the file has proved far more daunting. Fortunately for us, the Bodleian is facing a similar dilemma as they transform the British Book Trade Index from the uni uni University of Birmingham to their center for the book. Um, and, and they're also, I think, um, public, uh, sort of working on Michael Turner's um, database of the stationer's company, which, which is quite a tool. So, um, and we've talked with them about the creation of such authority work on trade roles as a future collaborative project between us, both agreeing that together we could account for how trade names morph between the British Isles and the American colonies slash United States in the 18th century. So Clark recorded all of her, all of the sources for her data on cards that have become, that have come to be known as authority cards. Um, I just want to show you one of those. Um, okay, so that's the card, right, which has kind of, it's like a reference card. So I just want to show you how we're dealing with that. <coughs> um, we want this source information to also be available to users of the database so that they can double check it and when necessarily send us corrections. Um, ultimately, and I meant th mentioned this in thinking about the card's lack of addresses, our idea here is that we want people to be able to contribute corrections, but, we also, but while we also maintain control over which of these contributions actually change our data in the database. We're aiming for what Jerome McCann, McGann argues for when he writes, quote, archival design, system design must build interfaces that allow user-initiated annotations to enrich the underlying data structures without compromising its formal stability, end quote. 
So to put it simply then, when the time comes, we plan to adopt a sort of curated crowdsourcing model for our work here. Um, I mean, a, a number of the projects at Jordan um, sort of took us through, you know, exactly the kinds of thing that, you know, our data should be sharing um, with, with that data. So um, DAPT will, I hope, prove vital in uncovering networks of association and affiliation that distinguish early Anglophone American cultures of print from that which many, from that which many of its pr practitioners had inherited. In this work of excavation and discovery, DEPT will also, I hope, reflect some of the new realities of intellectual labor within the digital humanities paradigm and the role that libraries and archives plan in that new reality. In her work uh, on Boston Library catalogs and institutions of reading, Barbara Mitchell concludes, quote, seen within its technological, cultural, and social context, the rise of the card catalog and the concomitant entrance of female clerical workers into increasingly bureaucratized libraries was a pivotal point not only in the history of libraries. The great library catalogs, early technology systems that would endure for decades, were catalysts for an extraordinary, mo extraordinary moment of institutional growth and change." End quote. The same might be said of the relational database and its relationship to the institutions in which they are constructed. Let me explain. From 1927 until her retirement in 1970, Avis Clark, a female clerical worker in an increasingly bureaucratized library, removed herself every Wednesday afternoon to flip through newspapers and reference books in the stacks of Antiquarian Hall, taking notes on anyone involved in the book trade, and then transforming these notes onto over 10,000 cards. In so doing, she created a resource that many, perhaps some in this very room, would benefit from, but really only one person could construct. As those of us at the AAS reorganize her system in another medium, and much to her credit, it is a system that we can fairly easily recreate the logic of, as I hope to have shown in the last 10 minutes or so, I must also recognize the ways in which Clark's working model falls apart in the digital age. DEPT has me thinking anew about how digital production helps us to access traditionally de-emphasized de forms of intellectual labor. Rather than debating whether databases constitute a new genre, territory well covered in a 2007 issue of PMLA, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the types of la labor that goes into database construction and how that labor might also be a catalyst for, quote, an extraordinary moment of institutional growth and change for archives. In particular, as I consult with AAS's Doris O'Keefe, who has been doing authority work for over 40 years, or call Trevor Muniz down at Myth to assess our efforts to make our data open and linkable, or sit in Jim Green's Locust Street office hashing out trade roll terminology, or listen to Michael Winship caution that some fight facts in the printer's file might in fact be wrong, I am reminded that this database is, to state the obvious, a collaborative process, production. This digital tool, which no one person could construct on her own, is one more way, I would argue, that this new media environment disrupts fantasies of agency, fantasies that have historically informed our romanticized notions of authorship and ownership, and I'm coming to realize the librarian, particularly the librarian in the archive. Digital humanities production processes force us to acknowledge right out of the gate that individuals, institutions, and the technologies of writing are codependent. Historians of writing technology, such as Adrian Johns and Lisa Maruka, argue that this codependence was, in fact, also foundational to print production. Jody Green, another cultural historian of authorship, contends that, in the spirit of Foucault, authorship was a cultural fantasy legally man manifested to control print production. The romanticized notion of ownership of intellectual labor grew out of the switch from state to market regulation of the press. From the 18th century onward, then, the agency that comes with ownership is essentially a form of interpolation, and the romantic notion of authorship that grows out of this legal ap apparatus downplays, but can never completely erase the codependence of individuals, institutions, and writing technology in the creation of print media. Book historians of the last few decades have done a lot of archival mining to uncover that codependence. And I'd like to think that DAPT will not only play a key role in continuing this work in the early Anglophone American context, but that the production of it will also do a small part to disrupt fantasies of intellectual labor that I would argue from, stem from the same moment as the creation of the author function. 
To put it simply, the collaborative nature of the work of print that Dieppe docu documents is, I hope to have shown, also the nature of the work that is needed to construct such a complex database. Thank you. Okay. I'm not going to try to moderate, so just direct your questions. Um, I'll only step in if there's, if I'm needed. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Loyola. Uh, a great set of papers. One of the things I wonder if I could ask all of you to maybe reflect on is the benefits and drawbacks of authorities' files. Uh, doing a lot of virtual library reconstructions right now, I, I see it both ways. Um, on the one hand, looking at marked records where the names of authors are not what's represented on the title page or in the material text, but in fact what sort of fall within you know, the sort of standards created by institutions that want to create these authorities' files. Uh, one way it feels like a, a divorce from the material text in a way that's, that's kind of complicating. But on the other, you know, the very need to create some sort of standardization. I'm sort of curious what you think as we try to, and I think there's a lot of talk here about how we get our projects to start to talk to each other. What are, for you, the benefits of raw mass of authorities' files? Should we be paying more attention to them, or are there caveats that you see? Well, I was actually going to steal what you were saying about uh, sort of occupational trade names, because that was that was a similar sort of thing where uh, I was essentially working from an authority file that was that directory. Initially, at least, that's what I that's what I thought I was doing, um, and it was one of those things that as a, and I was kind of doing this as sort of a proof of concept to see if it could uh, work. But as I was working through it, I realized that there were a lot of ways in which if I had gone back to the beginning and started over, I would have selected um, some other authority files, some other sort of database structure. Uh, but but that notion of those trades, if we were going to kind of try to incorporate, I can imagine just a day of. You know, if we were trying to make these two interact, I can imagine a day of trying to figure out where they overlap and where they completely don't, and how that would then sort of infect some of the other records. Uh, I, imagine, I imagine that nightmare probably <laughs> happened. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop. Um, uh, Russell wants to say anything or not, but um, uh, it's a good. It's a really good question that you raise, uh, Kyle. And 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 um, for us, the only way that we're using authority files is for names, right? So we're not getting into subject heading authority files. We don't have to because people are the organizing principle of this database. Um, so in some ways, I think that um, questions of yeah material representation, not to say that they go away there, but that they're mitigated, perhaps. The other thing that I think that the, the authority file is offering us, um, and this is also in our own mark record in our catalog, is we hope to, and I haven't quite figured out how we're going to do it yet, and if anyone has any ideas, I'd love to hear them, um, have name variation um, built into the database so that if you, you know, make the terrible mistake of putting Matthew Carey's name in with two T's, um, uh, after we judge you, we will know. <laughs> um, we, uh, you know, that it would be able, to, it would, that, that it would be smart enough to say, "Do you mean?" You know, <laughs> um, uh, and so that's something you know that you get from from NAF records that you get sort of like the, these are all the other ways that it appears. Because um, you do wonder, Atlantic people who go by many different names end up getting if somebody's making a choice about who they actually are. Right, right. If, they're, if the database itself is making decisions that limit out the I actual see. fluidity and, and creativity. Yeah, and I mean, in some ways, that's what's great about the NAF, right, is that I, we don't have to make those decisions. The Library of Congress made them for us, which is not to say, I mean, but as I said, NWA has contributed, you know, the AAS has contributed a great deal of information to those, to those files. So, um, yeah, yeah, that, that in order for it to be, I mean, I suppose, you know, another way to think about this is like for things to be, for data to be linked and open, it has to be exact um, or even searchable to some extent. Um, so we do lose a certain amount of ambiguity, um, you know, but then it's like, great, so come visit our archive, right? Mm -hmm. which, is, which is our bottom line always and forever, so. <laughs> Liz, did you? We'll take her silence. <laughs> Somebody ask Liz a question. See if she is. I bet she chime in on this. 
Maybe we should open that cheek. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Um, yeah. Okay, first, I just want to. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hang on. Sorry. Yeah. I'm here. There's just a really big delay. <laughs> she says she didn't get a question. Oh. I can try. Someone just repeat it for me. I'm trying to tweet her the question. I'm just on Twitter right now. Ah, too many, too many possibilities. <laughs> Proceed without me. Okay. Uh, Ed, you were starting to ask a question. Yeah, uh, both uh, Molly and Liz uh, mentioned that designing other projects. Um, I'll take it first for the delay. Um, it's not coming from the AAS. It's actually something that is that um, is more, I would say, coming from intersections of uh, you know library schools and digital humanities work. Um, and so I have had some exposure to that world, and and so therefore um, sort of have been introducing this idea. Um, and and as you can see, my efforts are modest at this point. Um, because we don't have a programmer, we don't have, I mean basically URIs are, are what I can do when it's just me. Um, uh, and if anybody has any ideas for how I could be doing it better or, or more thoroughly, given that we're sort of a limited shop, um, I would really appreciate that. But, um, but uh, it's the kind of thing that I would say, the kind of institution that we are and the, the history of, of cataloging that has been so incredibly strong at the AES for, for almost a century, um, it's something that, that we're getting to, uh, that, or that like will, I think, ultimately um, help us to reconceive of our catalog. But um, this is sort of, in terms of AES history, this is sort of a pilot pro project for thinking about linked open data. Anyone else want to respond to the question on linked open data? No. Oh. oh, she's typing. Can folks read the typing? I think part of the impulse is in part the contribution to the commons and not seeing the projects in isolation from one another. Joseph, yeah. Hello, Joseph, uh, here at Northeastern. I was intrigued by the stars on Jordan's presentation <coughs> with respect to specificity. And so I was looking and seeing if there was, you know, how do you specify a regional in Google Maps? And it looks like there's some JavaScript API that I tweeted under the hashtag that you can say a radius. Yeah. But even that doesn't necessarily correspond to what you found in the documents of a particular town, because how big is that town? Yeah. So I just thought that was really interesting. I wonder if you could speak more to uh, this, this challenge of specifying regions. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's frustrating because people navigating at the time, and those descriptions would be perfectly fine west of the bridge. Everybody knows what that means. It wouldn't take that long to actually find a location with that description. Um, but yeah, trying to describe the region in an online resource, uh, the time map JS uh, 
did have the option for entering rather than points, entering polygons. Uh, and so for a little while I toyed with, you know, for each entry, sort of creating, basically mapping out where, where within that area they could have been. But even that, I, it immediately became clear that it would just be the ugliest and most unmappable uh, resource you know, that you could ever see, uh, just because it would, it would just be a blur of you know, all these overlapping spaces. So it's something that I think, I think a custom interface that somebody was actually building uh, from the ground up could approach it uh, as the, you know, when you're sort of zoomed out, those pins appear, and then as you get closer, they sort of define themselves, maybe as a sort of polygon area that uh, that um, somebody could have been within, or in some other way. I think it's possible, it must be possible to sort of visualize that. But it was, yeah, I ended up having to dump half of uh, a big chunk of the records into the Narragansett Bay because that seemed like, you know, for Providence and the Providence and Newport, uh, there were so many who are just sort of citywide. And you want to be on the map if anybody's looking at the overall uh, city view. Uh, so yeah, my solution was to stick them out there and um, clearly identify that area as a space that didn't actually mean anything uh, as a location. It's, it was the biggest frustration. Hi, Jim Casey from University of Delaware. Um, one of the interesting threads that seems to me across all the sort of projects was the, the sort of formal version of, of that problem, which is shows up in, for example, note boxes. Um, where we sort of scribble a few notes about a thing. And, we don't technically have to sort of fit it into the formatting. So maybe if I could ask for each of you to sort of speak about how the notes are working or, you know, I mean, that's that's essentially sort of putting something off to the side, right, by not sort of creating a table forward and not sort of encoding it somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, the way that we have thought about it, um, I don't know how many of you have used the British Book Trade Index, but they sort of, if you if you search for someone, they give you like a, a real quick snapshot of their career. So um, the printer's files um, themselves will at times do that. So if they do, then we recreate them in the notes. But the, right, the problem becomes um, like for, for things like who whom they married or something like that, or, or who their parents were, um, that information is just so inconsistent because most of these, these uh, cards were 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 created uh, through reading obituaries and then you know checking reference books and things like that. So you know when you read obituaries, you don't always get the same kind of information, especially in the you know early um, uh, you know newspapers from the early nineteenth uh, uh, century. Um, so um, you know you don't want to create a table or even a field within a table where you're just going to have a whole bunch of blanks, right? Um, so um, that's the way we've handled it, and um, you know. I think it's an important, it's a, that's the kind of decision though that if, if people have ideas about or that if you think that we're doing something that we shouldn't be, I'd like to know now because that's a structural thing that, that we're not going to be able to fix, you know, we're not going to be able to change in the future. Um, uh, whereas other elements of it, um, you know, like leaving blanks and things like that for address information, you know. Um, but once the kind of format, once the, we're setting up the format now, we've, we've entered about 1600 names, um, which is, you know, um, a, a small fraction of the, um, the data dump that needs to happen. Um, uh, so um, uh, any kind of structural changes need to get made sooner than later. Speak now. Or Liz, has, Liz <laughs> has a response to. Uh, in the case of the Whitman Archive and other databases I've worked on, we started by coming up with the data model that we think will fit with our beliefs and that we want to communicate but it's necessary to have the notes field to put in things that don't fit. When we start to find ourselves consistently recording the same information in the notes field, then we start thinking about whether we need to create a new table or more structured field. Yeah, yeah and I, I guess I would just add that for me, I knew that the site was going to have a very sloppy sort of search, keyword search, that would just search everything sort of top to bottom. Oh, I'm sorry, did I interrupt? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, we're still done. Uh, uh, for example, uh, we've realized we're recording a lot more box and folder information because we have better access to it now. 
um, as it is at repositories. There's something we might want to move to, that's something we might want to move to a more standard format. So I was just going to say, uh, for this project, knowing that the search was going to be just kind of open to everything, uh, it was one of those situations where um, there is, like you say, that irregular data that, that was oftentimes useful um, about locations. So searching for the golden ball or searching for signs. But those were kind of things that, um, as you just indicated, I think eventually they would have turned into separate tables. Um, a separate table for basically evidence. Yeah, this is an issue though when we talk about using other people's data as well. It makes me think uh, I was I, I do a lot of work using historical census data, ma using it for mapping. And I was recently at a talk with a gentleman who works for the Census Bureau, and he was talking about their data that's uh, openly available. And he started his talk, which was it was really a talk aimed at contemporary audiences talking about the recent census data, but they also provide historical census data. And he brought up an image of a census form from 1790 with all of this marginal information scrawled into the side that, ha that wasn't part of the categories of the census, but it was like, this person's a printer, this person's a farmer. And uh, I think I was the only one who cared. But at the end, I raised my hand and said, well, when you digitized all that historical census data, what happened to the marginal information? And uh, at first, he was confused, because he didn't expect anyone to actually ask him about the historical <laughs> information. <laughs> And then I said, no, no, seriously, like, what happened to the marginal? And he said, oh, I, I don't know, it's gone. And it's, it's not in the digital version. They didn't transcribe it when they made the database. And so if you're using that data, to even be aware that that wasn't transcribed is important. Speaking of which, what gets lost, I have a question for Liz. I wondered if they have any... Um, I think they do have visual um, databases on the Whitman Archive, and those are a little bit more complicated because you have to do a lot of basically acrostic explanation of what you see in the images. So it also answers <coughs> your questions about subject searches. Um, how does the archive deal with that, and how do they decide exactly what their responsibility is when they're making just um, kind of, I guess, interpretive decisions? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, for the the image gallery on the Whitman Archive, actually, that information is um, all in XML files right now. So it's not the same kind of database format that um, you've been talking about so far, but we still, of course, face the issue of description and um, subject headings and that kind of thing. Now, for the most part, we have, um, we've just not dealt with it. I mean, if we're being honest, because we thought, well, what, what is important to most people within the context of the Whitman archive is that this is an image of um, of Whitman. That's what people are interested in. We have started to have some new discussions about that, though, as we've been moving from just kind of very basic, um, non-standard XML format to moving this um, the image information into VRA core XML. And at what level we want to draw those distinctions. Ed Folsom indicated we could record information for every um, photograph that Whitman is wearing a hat or where there's an animal present. And so for us, we decided that what we would focus on is the um, you know, a description, including a link to some authority file, whether it was Library of Congress or Getty. Um, for all of the people depicted in the images, and, and then um, if the sort of place um, either represented in the photograph was significant, or the place of the photograph's um, creation or the image's creation was important, that's what we would provide. Um, Within the context of the Whitman archive, though, our descriptions tend to, to center around Whitman, and so um, that makes them less useful for a lot of contexts, but it also provides us with the, a center um, that we have that maybe other types of projects don't. We have time for one more question. So I, I realized that we, we failed to say that this, this opening session, uh, 
was organized differently than every other session in the program. Uh, it was organized by the American Antiquarian Society. Um, is there anything about the logic of organization that you wanted to say, Molly? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and, Besides, thank you. Yeah, and, and the AAS is also um, co-sponsoring the reception this afternoon, uh, which is, that's on the program, but I, I wanted to say it as well. Um, so we're going to break for lunch now. If you don't know where to eat around Northeastern, there uh, is a list of places nearby on the, on the conference website. Uh, also, those of you from Northeastern, could you wave? Grab one of those folks <laughs> if you don't know where to eat and ask them where to eat. Um, we, we'll be back here uh, at 1.30, I believe it is, for our first roundtable and bucking academic uh, tradition yet again, we are going to have our roundtable at an actual round table. <laughs> um, I, I realize I've never seen such a thing, so uh, that's what we're going to do. Uh, so thanks, and uh, we'll, we'll see you back after lunch. <laughs>